Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. I'm Dennis Ward. A $530 million settlement is being hailed as a historic victory for some of the most vulnerable people in Manitoba. An agreement in principle was made public this week in the long-running class action lawsuit. It will see the province pay children in the child welfare system over the misappropriation of the children's special allowances or CSAs over a period of 14 years. At any given time, roughly 10,000 kids are in care in Manitoba. 90% of them are Indigenous. Two of the plaintiffs in the case, both former executives at child welfare agencies, called the holdback of the CSA's theft and said it was a practice that discriminated against the most vulnerable children in the province. You can compare this situation to, say, if uh, your child's not in care and uh, you're in receipt of the, uh, child, uh, the child tax credit, the benefit, and, uh, and then the government turns around, the provincial government, and takes that amount off your, your paycheck. You know, I, I think that parents in Manitoba who receive this child tax benefit would be outraged. It's, it's our concern as plaintiffs that right from the start we were adamant that every cent has to go back to these kids. Like the amount that was taken dollar for dollar, any, any um, interest that accrued over that time period for that money, the value of that money today, as well as charter damages, that, that goes directly to the kids. And that's how we hope and, and we'll be adamant that in the distribution plan that that is what happens. Our Lady of the Assumption Roman Catholic Church in Iqaluit is asking City Council to exempt them from property taxes or says they could fall into debt. Trevor Wright has that story. In 2022, the City of Iqaluit passed a bylaw requiring charities and religious institutions to pay property taxes. The only Catholic church in town has been paying their taxes, but they want to change that. John Maurice was part of the church delegation at this week's council meeting. Now we would venture to guess that most of the institutions will not be able to pay the amount imposed upon them and they will enter into debtor status with the city. There's Various other churches in the city get partial exemptions. The Pentecostal, Jehovah Witnesses and Anglicans pay only 25% out of its total property taxes. According to city documents, nonprofit and charitable organizations such as homeless shelters get full exemptions. Maurice says the church shouldn't have to pay property taxes and being ordered to do so is a human rights issue. I'm going to humbly make the suggestion to you that the step that you should take is to repeal this bylaw. It can probably be tested by the only, uh, you know, Human Rights Tribunal, by the courts, uh, through petitions. According to the church's presentation, they paid 41000 in property taxes to the city in 2023. In the end, city council listened to the presentation but did not discuss it or make a decision. Councillor Romain Stevenson sums it up. Aaron, thank you all for the presentation. I'm fairly certain this is an item that this council will take up. Trevor Wright, APTN National News, Iqaluit. In Ottawa last week, the Canadian Auditor General, Karen Hogan, released a report to Parliament that says the federal government is failing to improve housing conditions for First Nations. APTN's Chris Stewart spoke to Treaty 8 Grand Chief Arthur Noski on his reaction to the report. Last week's report by the Auditor General did not hold back on criticizing the federal government on how it has funded housing on Indigenous communities across the country. Karen Hogan's report says that many First Nation members do not have access to safe housing. This is their fourth report on housing conditions in 20 years. And it says conditions have not changed in that time. After four audit reports, I can honestly say that I am completely discouraged that so little has changed and that so many First Nations individuals and families continue to live in substandard homes. For the Prairies, Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Alberta, 
The report says communities have been underfunded by $140 million since 2008 for housing because the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation is using population data from the 2001 census. Money needed to build and repair homes. APTN spoke to Arthur Noski, the Grand Chief of the Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta at a recent Keepers of the Water conference. He is very concerned about the lack of funding increases. I come from a membership that's about uh, 700 population and at the time where we kind of got into this process in the 92, 1992, our, uh, our housing funding was 137,000. So going on 30 years plus, it's still 137,000. Indigenous people are the fastest growing population in Canada, increasing by 9.4 percent from 2016 to 2021, according to the 2021 census. Grand Chief Noski says the federal government hasn't taken higher populations into account. Through a, a land claim process, they use numbers of uh, 3.9 people per house to a max of 5.2, 5.3 per household. So if they take the populations now in First Nations country and do that calculations, I think that funding would adjust drastically. He says the federal government continues to ignore treaty rights. Housing is very crucial. It's very crucial to your, your, your health, you know, and uh, your, your confidence and your demeanor. But I know, like I said, they keep doing things that don't honor what the agreements are supposed to be. The CMHC has now agreed to use the latest census data by the end of 2025 for funding. Both they and Indigenous Services Canada say they accept all of the report's recommendations. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Now to Vancouver, where the Danger Cats are once again making headlines as they continue with a comedy routine that reportedly makes, includes making fun of murder victims and residential school survivors. As T APTN's Tina House reports, family members of the many victims showed up to a rally, what they are calling hate speech. Joke? This isn't a joke? Look at this. Look at this. This is hate. This is a crime. My auntie, she was a daughter. She was a mother. She was an auntie, a cousin. Close to 100 people showed up to protest against the Danger Cats, a comedy group from Alberta that makes fun of the many victims of serial killer Robert Picton. And shockingly, they decided to hold their show in the exact neighborhood where many of the women went missing from and were later murdered including Lorelai Williams' own cousin, Tanya Holick. She was killed on the Picton farm. We cannot allow the genocidal violence against marginalized women and girls to become fodder for entertainment and or some sad attempt at humor. These views perpetuate dangerous stereotypes and discrimination. It was this very discrimination that allowed Picton and his associates to prey upon these women for so long. After no awareness about what they were making aside. jokes about increased, no many venues they were set to perform in no canceled their aside. shows. Danger Cats were also selling t-shirts that read 50 flavors of hookery smoked bacon, but that merchandise was removed from their website due to a public outcry. Despite all the criticism of their comedy show, Danger Cats vowed to continue a small tour in secret of venues. Only ticket holders were notified the day of the show with an address of the location. And their secret location is here at a privately owned gym called F45. As ticket holders showed up, they were shamed by the crowd and things got heated. Let the camera see them! Shame on you! All of you! Let them! Let the camera see their faces! And this, again, look, this is what the cops uphold. They uphold hate, 
They uphold racism. They uphold the ongoing genocide of indigenous people. Michelle Pinot's daughter, Stephanie Lane, was just 20 years old when she was killed by Picton. Pinot bought a ticket to the show because she wanted to know where the secret location was going to be to come here and rally against it. But when she tried to enter, police would not let her in. Let her in. You only let white males and white women in? Is this an apartheid right now? Is the BPD doing an apartheid right now? Whites only? For 27 years, I've been trying to lead a life of some kind of normal, which when degenerates like this bring it up is impossible. It's like putting the knife in and turning it, picking the scab over and over and over and over. It's inhumane, it's torture, what these people are putting families through. APTN News contacted the owner of the gym and he claimed to know nothing about the event and apologized to anyone that was offended. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. The downtown east side. A singer from Saskatchewan is blowing away the judges on a Canadian talent show. That story and more after the break. Welcome back. The federal government has announced new funding to help combat gender-based violence on the prairies. Sierra Bettens has the story. Today, 17 organizations across Manitoba and Saskatchewan receive federal funding to combat gender-based violence. At a press conference at the Forks, Marcy Ian, Minister for Women, Gender Equality and Youth, unveiled $7.4 million in funding for violence prevention and capacity building. This funding is about helping these organizations prevent, because that's important, we don't want it to happen in the first place, and address gender-based violence and find long-lasting solutions for their communities. Ian said the funding will go to Indigenous organizations. So my name According is to Hilda Statistics Anderson. Canada, more than 6 in 10 Indigenous women have experienced physical or sexual assault in their lifetime. Shanley Scott, the executive director at Nadinawe, so an organization that works with at-risk youth, says the funding will help them develop a kinship-based model to address the issue. Model. We often are kind of confined to a Western framework, and um, so we're going to utilize the funds to develop uh, a framework that is more indicative of, of who we are as Indigenous peoples and supports the voices of the children we serve, children and youth we serve, as well as the voices of our elders and knowledge keepers. Hilda Anderson Pierce is the chair of the National Family and Survivor Circle. She says more must be done to connect Indigenous peoples living in rural and remote communities to these services. According to 2019 Statistics Canada data, women living in rural and remote communities experience intimate partner violence at rates nearly twice as high as those in urban areas. We need to really um, be very nimble in providing these resources and building the capacity in remote isolated areas because women cannot and children cannot and our two-spirit and gender diverse relatives cannot suffer in silence. We need to ensure that they have wraparound supports, you know, that are rooted in Indigenous ways of being, knowing and doing. Anderson Pierce adds that governments must include the perspectives of Indigenous women and gender diverse people in policy decisions around gender-based violence. Sierra Bettens, APTN National News, Winnipeg. A young Indigenous woman from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan brought her voice to the Canada's Got Talent show. Rebecca Strong won the Golden Buzzer and punched her ticket to the next round of the competition. Our reporter Rachel May spoke with Rebecca about her big win. Rebecca Strong has been singing since she was five. Last night, her determination paid off. Since winning the Golden Buzzer last night, she's been swarmed with positive messages. I feel like Indigenous people come together 
so beautifully. Strong has been following the auditions for Canada's Got Talent, and she's excited to see all of the competitors. If I'm being really honest, I don't see this as a competition. I see it as a bunch of people um, showcasing their talent. And if a person wins, then that's amazing on them. Not only did she guarantee a spot in the next stage of the show, she won $25,000. But Strong says she's not going out of her way to spend it. Helping my parents out, I love... I love them so much, and I really think I'm just going to save the money. Canada's Got Talent airs every Tuesday until the finale on May 14th, where the million dollar winner will be named. Oh Rachel God. May, APTN National News, Saskatoon. Love Rebecca's views that it's not a competition. It's been a big week for Indigenous musicians as many walked away from the 2024 Junos with some hardware. We'll fill you in on some of the winners after the break. Welcome back. Roughly two years ago, we first brought you a story on Owl Boy, a young First Nations entrepreneur from the Yukon who was stitching a name for himself in the fashion world one beat at a time. Now, Owl Boy has another feather in his hat, his very own clothing line. You're Sarah Connors with that story. So it's just pretty simple clothing, but I put a lot of work into it. And After two years of hard work, Cohen Quash is celebrating the launch of his new indigenous clothing line. It's an impressive feat considering he's 14 years old. I'm really, really proud about it, like kind of bringing back my culture and all that. At such a young age, is really impressive for me. Quash is Casca, Taltan, and Clinket. His new line, Bestie Owls, is an ode to his signature pendant beadwork, much of which features owls. These are the bags I made. Then I made like fanny packs. The line will include ready to wear clothing, accessories, and of course, beading. I just like really thought, like, what if I did modern day clothing? Like stuff that people wear in a normal day. The young designer has received much acclaim for his work. Last year, he was the youngest person to have his work acquired by Yukon government's permanent art collection. He also created the three gorgeous pendants pictured behind me. Quash's success is no surprise to mentor Duma Alward. The online boutique shop owner first began selling Quash's work when he was 12. The two have been besties ever since. It's humbling for me, it's proud mama almost feeling like I feel like the mother hen and I get beaming with pride. So happy for him. He deserves this. He's a really great human being. I want to thank everyone who supported me on my journey from 2021 to 2024. In 2022, Mom Barbara Morris also couldn't be more proud. I feel like his future holds Paris, New York, and all the places he wants to go, Toronto, Vancouver, and I'm excited to be along for the ride. The young designer's plan now is to go to more fashion shows. He hopes to one day be the next big Indigenous designer. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Love that story. Over 1,300 young athletes from BC First Nations gathered in the city of Terrace last week. The youth came to compete in one of the largest basketball tournaments in Canada, the Junior All-Native. APTN's Lee Wilson was there. Nearly 90 basketball teams represented their communities at the Junior All-Native tournament. The youth competed against each other in four divisions from Monday to Friday, the first week of spring break in the province. Evan Gabriel and Eli Hall say they are proud to represent the New Hulk Nation, located on BC Central Coast. They put in lots of work for a chance to play. A lot of practices. Yeah, a lot of practices, fundraising. Yeah, it's been, it's been lots of fundraising, it's crazy. The Niska Nation is the tournament's host this year in the city of Terrace in Northern BC. Due to the size of the games, in order to provide accommodations and arenas, the Niska held the Junior All-Native in Simshan territory. Michael Davis is one of the managers. He explains how big the event is for the community. This year we have 85 teams in four divisions, so 
we have about 1,320 athletes here. That's just the athletes. So you think about the, the managers, the coaches, the chaperones. So there's quite a bit of people in town this week. According to Davis, the junior all native allows communities to come together. We like to gather and uh, you know, this is a gathering of people where uh, a lot of the coaches, the managers, you know, they played before and, you know, they see players from other communities. It's a chance to connect again. The arenas were packed with fans, cheering on athletes, and volunteers making sure the games were a success. The youth tested their basketball skills against other nations in a double knockout basketball tournament until one team was crowned champion. Um, it's pretty fun to see other nations, like play, play ball with other nations, yeah. The Junior All Native Committee says the tournament is not just about basketball, but improving youth mental health. We're trying to bring inclusion in and we're trying uh, to build up the self-esteem, you know, the wellness and, you know, through sport, that's a great way to learn. Kelowna was announced as the location for next year's Junior All Native Basketball Tournament. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Terrace. Now to the 2024 Juno Awards, which were held in Halifax on Sunday. Angel Moore has a wrap-up of all the Indigenous artists who went home with some of the hardware. The 2024 Junos honoured the achievements of Canadian music and this year did not disappoint with Indigenous artists. A. Sanabi from the Sandy Lake First Nation in Northern Ontario won Songwriter of the Year and Alternative Album of the Year. Uh, I grew up in a, in a trailer in Northern Ontario without electricity and running water and now I'm here. Traditional Indigenous Artist or Group of the Year was awarded to Joel Wood. Wood has also performed with Northern Cree. Accompanied on stage with his wife, Wood thanked the youth. And I want to give a shout out to all those little res boys, res girls back home who turn over their, their mom's laundry basket and they jam them powwow songs and Sundance songs and prayer songs. Inuk singer and songwriter Ailey Seppi won Indigenous Artist or Group of the Year. So this is to my uncle's um, Saglak band. They formed a rock and roll band after their residential schools and they pretty much formed me. They made me who I am. Contemporary Roots Album of the Year went to William Prince of the Peguas First Nation. Prince played music with his father at gigs in northern Manitoba. All the youth of the Peguas First Nation. Uh, it takes a real village to lift somebody like myself so high. So thank you so much for this honour and stand in the joy, my friends. The 2025 Junos will be held in Vancouver. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Djibouti, also called Halifax. What a Junos it was. The Robbie Robertson uh, event there was something else too. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this weekend. Of course, for news anytime, you can visit our website. That's aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Marcy McGuitch, thanks for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your long weekend.